This is a video cast as part of the University of Kentucky College of Medicine Department of Anesthesiology Keyword Review Series. It's general clinical number two focusing in on ear, nose, and throat and eyes. Let's first look at the keywords from 2010 to 2017 on ear, nose, and throat and eye. Under ENT you can see that laryngeal innervation, laser airway fires, complications of thyroid surgery, and jet ventilation are the ones that are in bold and the most commonly showed up as IT keywords. Under eye, you can see postoperative blindness and anatomy, oculocardiac reflex, nitrous oxide and sulfur hexafluoride gas, and retrobulbar and peribulbar block as the top keywords from 2010 to 2017. So let's start with airway innervation and ENT topics. Cranial nerve number five supplies the nose and the nasal pharynx. So if you're doing a nasal intubation, you would have to uh, topically anesthetize the distribution of cranial nerve number five as demonstrated by the light blue on the bottom right figure. Cranial nerve number nine supplies the tongue and oral pharynx in the upper epiglottis, and that's the gag reflex. Cranial nerve number 10 is the vagus, and it is represented by pink in the lower bottom. The cranial nerve number 9 was yellow, and as we focus in on the distribution of the vagus nerve, the figure up at the top right helps show that. The vagus nerve is shown in blue, and there's branches of it. One, the superior laryngeal nerve, which has an internal portion which pierces the thyrohyoid membrane is sensory above the vocal cords as opposed to the external portion which is motor to one muscle, the motor to the cricothyroid while the recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies all the other muscles. So if you're going to do a superior laryngeal nerve block you'd do it bilaterally at the level of the thyrohyoid membrane trying to block the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Now the recurrent laryngeal nerve shown in green is also a branch of the vagus nerve. Recurrent because it comes back up and supplies sensory below the glottis and it supplies sensory to all of the trachea and is motor to all the muscles of the larynx except that one muscle supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve which was the cricothyroid. To block the distribution of the recurrent laryngeal nerve we often stick a needle through the cricothyroid membrane and inject local anesthetic and the patient can cough distributing that local anesthetic up and down the trachea which is the distribution of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. If the recurrent laryngeal nerve is damaged unilaterally usually you get voice changes and hoarseness but bilaterally you can get a total loss of ability to speak and total airway obstruction. If it's partially injured the uh, vocal cords can be adducted together bilaterally causing acute obstruction while as opposed to if there's complete transection of the nerve the vocal cords tend to be paralyzed in a paramedian position and move like little curtains with air moving in and out of the trachea usually not with uh, complete obstruction. Continuing on with laryngeal anatomy remember that the recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies all the muscles except that tensor of the vocal cords, the cricothyroid, which was supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve external branch. So if we look at the star on the far right, you can see the cricothyroid muscle, that's the tensor of the vocal cords. Then there's the posterior cricoarotenoid at the blue arrow. As that contracts, it abducts or pulls apart uh, the vocal cords. And then the lateral cricoarotenoids when they contract, they adduct or pull the vocal cords together. As you look at the picture on the bottom left, you can see the true vocal cords in white, the false vocal cords laterally to them, and in the far recesses on each side of the glottic opening, you can see the piriform fossa, where oftentimes when we place an NG tube, a TE probe, and sometimes our fiber optic scope, uh, it ends up in that piriform fossa and one way to tell that when you're fiber optically innovating someone is oftentimes the light will be laterally positioned in the neck. Let's go to thyroidectomy complications. Superior nerve 
uh, damage can occur, recurrent laryngeal nerve damage can occur, and if superior laryngeal nerve is injured during thyroidectomy, the patient will often get a weak voice which has been described as whispery. There is not complete obstruction of the airway with superior laryngeal nerve injury. The cricothyroid muscle, which is innervated by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, is that tensor of the vocal cords. So if you can't tense the vocal cords, you can't speak as well, and it's called a weak voice or whispery voice, not complete airway obstruction. Now, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, you lose the ability to pull the vocal cords apart, abduction, but you can have intact adduction because the cricothyroid is not supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and the vocal cords tend to be in a paramedian position, and you can get airway obstruction. One way to monitor for injury to uh, the nerves of the neck is use an EMG, and that's what the picture on the far right bottom is supposed to be showing. That tube has little wires attached to it, and a piece of metal down towards the pilot balloon. In our institution, this is called a NIMS tube. And as you place this hopefully quite large tube, because you want it to form a, a seal in there, or be uh, filling up the vocal cord space, use a large tube to assure contact. Don't put local anesthetic like viscous lidocaine on the tube or on the vocal cords, and don't use laryngeal tracheal anesthesia, or you'll numb up uh, the area where this metal makes contact with the vocal cords. And also don't use a prolonged neuromuscular blockade because as they dissect in the neck and get near nerves and the vocal cords move and make contact with that metal piece, an alarm goes off assuming that you have not paralyzed the patient or have not used local anesthetic uh, near the vocal cords. Up at the top right shows vocal cord paralysis uh, during respiration on the top line and phonation on the bottom line. The thing to point out is that unilateral paralysis or paramedian position of the vocal cord is what can occur. And if there is bilateral paralysis, the vocal cords can be stuck together in a paramedian position and cause airway obstruction. Parathyroid injury is another thing that can occur during thyroidectomy. And the acute hypocalcemia that occurs with parathyroid injury is usually occurring about 24 to 48 hours, one to two days, in a small number of patients after thyroid surgery. How do they present? They can present with laryngeal strider and spasm, tingling in their lips and fingertips as the calcium gets very low, carpal pedal spasm, Trousseau's sign, or Shawstick sign, the classic if you inflate a blood pressure cuff on someone's arm, who has parathyroid injury and acute hypocalcemia, their hand spasms, carpal pedal spasm, or if you tap on the side of their uh, forehead in the facial nerve distribution, you can get a uh, contraction of the orbicularis oculi, which is called Shawstick sign. And as calcium gets lower and lower, the QT interval can become prolonged. Now the treatment of acute hypocalcemia from parathyroid injury is intravenous calcium and potentially airway management, such as CPAP or intubation, may become necessary. A neck hematoma is another complication of thyroidectomy, and if the neck is expanding, you need to get that incision open and uh, get rid of the hematoma that can be obstructing an airway. Hopefully there's an ENT surgeon that can do that, but occasionally in emergent situations, the neck may need to be opened by the anesthesiologist, Remember that these patients are in extremis, their airway can be very deviated from normal, and that if you put them to sleep and paralyze them, you may not be able to intubate them. So keeping them awake and breathing spontaneously and opening the incision is one of the things that you should consider. Let's move on to lasers and airway fire, another ENT topic. How do we decrease the risk of laser-generated airway fires? One is use an endotracheal tube if you need to use an endotracheal tube that is laser resistant. The most laser resistant is these stainless steel tubes shown on the top right. Some of them even have double cuffs just in case one of the cuffs is hit by the laser and uh, deflated. So flexible steel cuffs, that is flexible steel tubes, are very resistant to laser. 
You can inflate the endotracheal tube balloon also with saline or a dye like methylene blue that if the laser hits the uh, pilot balloon and it explodes, the methylene blue can be distributed in the airway and you would know right away that the laser had hit the balloon. You moisten exposed surfaces uh, of the patient and in the uh, oral pharynx with saline soaked gauze. And remember that PVC tubes are flammable but less so than red rubber or silicon endotracheal tubes. So the most resistant is the laser resistant tubes, the steel ones. We can also reduce available FiO2, trying to keep our FiO2 low. Usually we say less than 30%. We can substitute uh, some of the oxygen with helium or air. Remember that nitrous oxide can support combustion. Removal of flammable material from the airway. If you can do the ENT procedure without a tube in place, uh, then you don't have that flammable object uh, sitting there that the laser could hit. Apneic techniques and jet ventilation are options. And then management of an airway fire, if it occurs, we should follow the ASA Practice Advisory 2013. Immediately, without waiting, remove the tracheal tube. That's number one, remove the tracheal tube, stop the flow of all airway gases, flood the surgical field with saline, and reestablish ventilation, and consider bronchoscopy to get rid of pieces of endotracheal tube that might be in the airway. But the first thing to do, immediately without waiting, remove the tracheal tube. Some common laser types and risks. Carbon dioxide lasers have a limited penetration, and YAG lasers penetrate deeper. So CO2 lasers, uh, are going to injure, if you didn't have goggles on and got hit by the laser, the cornea because it isn't absorbed very far, limited penetration. The YAG laser, however, can cause injury to the retina of the eye uh, if you're not wearing special tinted goggles that are needed. The YAG laser is usually reserved for debulking and coagulating and removing obstructing airway tumors. Next topic is obstructive sleep apnea versus obesity hypoventilation syndrome. And let's look at obstructive sleep apnea first. What do you do if obstructive sleep apnea is suspected? In the pre-op clinic, we use the stop bang questionnaire that asks, do you snore? Are you tired? Uh, there's significant other. Do you observe them stopping breathing at, while they're sleeping at night? Are they hypertensive? Do they have a large BMI greater than 35? Are they older, greater than 50, and do they have a large neck circumference, and are they male? And those are the risk factors for obstructive sleep apnea. So male greater than female risk factors may be increased risk with obesity, and the pattern is this. As that male patient, who's usually quite heavy, is sleeping at night, they choke or gasp during sleep and recurrently awaken. So more than five obstructive breathing events on polysomnography, sleep testing, in a male patient who's a little overweight would be the classic finding. These patients rarely have pulmonary hypertension, unlike obstructive, that is, obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Obesity hypoventilation syndrome has an equal distribution, male versus female, and these are the ones that at night, their CO2 builds up, their oxygen goes down, their saturation goes down, they don't have that choking or gasping, they just don't breathe as much. And if their CO2 is up and their oxygen is down for extended periods of time, they can get pulmonary hypertension, which is much more common than obstructive sleep apnea. At night, if you are monitoring them in a sleep lab, their CO2 going up during sleep greater than 10 millimeters of mercury from awake supine values, and their oxygen desaturation occurring during sleep not explained by them stopping breathing, then you say, aha, that's obesity hypoventilation sy syndrome. Some miscellaneous topics related to ear, nose, and throat. The first is jet ventilation, and the picture at the top right is showing tubing coming in and a little uh, jet ventilator attached. It can be used during airway surgery, and as you hit the little lever that creates the high pressure that jets air in and by venturi effect and trains air, what can happen is, one, you can oxygenate, but oftentimes CO2 builds up. So hypoventilation with hypercarbia is one of the potential side effects of prolonged jet ventilation. Also, if you're hitting 
the little lever and blowing air down into the airway under high pressure, you can get pneumomediastinum, air building up in the mediastinum, and pneumothorax, although that's relatively rare, it is a side effect. As you're jet ventilating the patient, you can't just keep hitting the lever and holding it down because you'd continue to blow air in and not allow a proper exhalation time. So allowing time for exhalation, letting go and letting air come out is important. And if a patient had some form of airway obstruction, you could see how air could build up in the airway and cause a barotrauma. Now the carotid sinus reflex often occurs during uh, carotid um, artery surgery when manipulation of the neck is occurring. So bradycardia, when manipulation of the carotid sinus, often during a neck dissection or in the case of ENT surgery, or carotid endarterectomy in the case of vascular surgery, it is a 9-10 glossopharyngeal cranial nerve, vagal nerve reflex. So from the carotid sinus stimulation, the ninth nerve is the afferent, carries that signal to the brainstem, while the tenth nerve, the cranial nerve number 10, the vagus, is the efferent, which carries it to the heart, and the reflex is bradycardia with stimulation of the carotid sinus in the neck. Nitrous oxide, we often avoid in middle ear surgery, tympanic grafts, because if it built up in that middle ear and you had a tympanic graft uh, sitting in there, it could blow that tympanic graft right off. Lafort 2 and 3 fractures or mid-facial fractures, uh, these are frequently associated with skull fractures, base of the skull fractures, and dural tears. And if you put a nasal tube uh, or a nasogastric tube, for example, into the nose in a patient with a mid-facial fracture, you risk putting that right up into the brain. So nasal intubation is relatively contraindicated is contraindicated in Lafort fractures and don't put in a gastric tube up the nose either. Let's look at some eye topics now. Pharmacology. Intravenous and inhaled agents, our volatile anesthetics as well as almost all of our intravenous agents, decrease intraocular pressure. Now one of the exceptions is ketamine which causes nystagmus, the eyes look side to side, blepharospasm, uh, and that can both, the nystagmus and the blepharospasm, cause an increase in intraocular pressure. Ketamine also increases blood flow to the eye, and so all those things together, intraocular pressure can go up. Nitrous oxide expands sulfur hexafluoride gas bubbles that can be used during retinal detachment surgery. Ophthalmologists can inject sulfur hexafluoride in the back of the eye, which pushes the retina back and kind of holds it in place and that sulfur hexafluoride bubble stays there for quite an extended period of time and we're instructed to avoid nitrous oxide for four to six weeks after that bubble has been in place because if nitrous was given to a patient with an SF6 bubble that bubble could expand and raise the uh, pressure in the back of the eye. Succinylcholine can also increase intraocular pressure. It does it for a short period of time and the major reason for it doing it is, to, it, is that it raises uh, choroidal blood flow, blood flow to the eye. Not so much because it causes fasciculation of the muscles around the eyeball. In fact, uh, experiments have been done where the muscles have been removed from an animal around their eye and succinylcholine still raised intraocular pressure. Atropine and scopolamine are uh, dilators of the eyeball. And someone who has acute angle closure glaucoma, if you dilate their eyeball, it's like the iris is like a curtain pulling back to the corners of the eyeball where the little canalis schlem is, which drains the fluid out of the eyeball. And if you pull the curtains back by making those pupils dilated, the curtains can fold back, obstruct the canalis schlem, and the fluid doesn't drain, and the pressure builds up. And so acute angle closure glaucoma can occur. So we avoid these atropine scopolamine drugs in patients with acute angle closure glaucoma. Now topical eye medications you really need to think that anything that's put in the eye can be absorbed and have an effect systemically. An example of this would be phenylephrine which can raise blood pressure, beta blockers 
that can cause systemic bradycardia and bronchospasm, not just have an ophthalmologic effect. Echothiophate is a classic one that uh, when these drops are put in the eye, they can be absorbed and irreversibly inhibit pseudocholinesterase. Pseudocholinesterase, as you remember, is the enzyme that uh, breaks down succinylcholine. So if you have irreversible inhibition of pseudocholinesterase and you give someone succinylcholine, you can imagine that could last a very long time. Another drug that can be put in the eye is acetazolamide or Dimox. This is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor that we talked about when we were talking about acclimatization to altitude. It causes you to pee bicarbonate and uh, a metabolic acidosis can ensue. And if you draw blood gas from someone taking Dimox and you saw a metabolic acidosis, that may be the explanation for it. Some post-operative ocular complications. The first is corneal abrasion. If you don't tape the eye shut well and the eyes get dry during surgery, a patient can wake up and have eye pain, tearing and photophobia, bright lights bother them, and if they blink it hurts. And this is the picture on the top right with the fluorescene staining, the greenish yellow staining, and you can see the scratch on this patient's cornea. Frequently, uh, if you watch carefully as someone's intubating and the eyes are not taped shut, uh, you can see that how easy it would be for a stethoscope or a hand or the laryngoscope or a tube to uh, scratch the eyeball. So we often will tape the eyes shut before we do airway manipulation after the patient is induced with gen for general anesthesia. So corneal abrasion is one. Lots of pain when they wake up in the recovery room. Central retinal artery occlusion is the next example. In a patient who is laying prone for an extended period of time with pressure on their eyeball, they can get this central retinal artery occlusion and their eye tends to be bulging a little bit, chemotic, hyphema, hyphema can be present, uh, bruising around the lids with a pale edematous retina and cherry red spot. Uh, and that picture on the far right is a classic cherry red spot characteristic of the central retinal artery occlusion. So think of a prone patient with pressure on the eyeball after head and neck surgery wakes up uh, with blindness. Cortical blindness, occipital lesions on MRI, the uh, occipital lobe is an area for possible watershed infarctions and this is classic after for example coronary bypass graft surgery where they were on a bypass machine the blood pressure was very low for an expended, extended period of time they can have that watershed infarction of the occipital lesions of the uh, occipital lobe that is of the brain and if you looked in their back of their eye it would normal optic disc normal pupillary response and so it is a brain problem not an eye problem per se acute angle closure glaucoma if you use midratic drugs which dilate uh, the pupil and make that iris uh, like a curtain fold back against the corners of the eye, block the canella schlem outflow of the fluid, the pressure can build up in the eye. And that patient in the recovery room is complaining of severe eye pain. You look at the eye and it looks like a dead eyeball. Blurred vision, uh, scopolamine or atropine, for example, may have been used eyeball looks dead, think acute angle closure glaucoma. Perioperative blindness and ischemic optic neuropathy. Ischemic optic neuropathy is the number one cause of uh, blindness, often after spine surgery and often after uh, the prone position. It can be unilateral, it can be bilateral, it's painless visual loss, and the uh, position of ischemia to the optic nerve can be called anterior or posterior. If it's anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, you, if you're very skilled, can look in the back of the eye and see optic disc edema present. And the picture at the far right is a pale and swollen optic disc. Um, and this is uh, consistent with AION or anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. You can actually see the uh, problem as opposed to posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which is farther back in the optic nerve, the optic disc itself may appear normal, but both are forms of ischemic optic neuropathy, classically associated with spine surgery. 
in the prone position, long periods of general anesthesia, large amounts of blood loss, male sex, and obesity potential risks. And the recommendations from the American Society of Anesthesia um, in the practice advisory is mix colloids with your crystalloids to maintain intravascular volume. There is no specific transfusion threshold that we should say, aha, we better transfuse the patient because this patient is at risk for ION, but allowing someone to become very anemic and hypotensive who's undergoing spine surgery could potentially put them at risk for ION. Check their head position and avoid uh, allowing their head to be down below the heart and keep their head in a neutral position. All things that we can do to try to decrease the risk of ION. Intraocular pressure, normally about 10 to 22 millimeters of mercury. What things decrease it and what things increase it? Our intravenous anesthetics, pretty much all of them, except for ketamine, and our inhaled anesthetics decrease intraocular pressure. If you let the blood pressure drop, if the CVP is low, all those things decrease intraocular pressure. So if someone had really high intraocular pressure, you would expect that induction with propofol, for example, um, hyperventilating them, allowing their blood pressure to drop a little bit, and uh, not allowing them to be filled with fluids with a high CVP would be all things that could decrease intraocular pressure. Things that increase intraocular pressure, succinylcholine does it transiently, just for a couple minutes, um, and this is not reliably blocked by, for example, giving small doses of rock uranium to defasciculate them. So if you're trying uh, to uh, block that transient increase of intraocular pressure that occurs with succinylcholine, it's not going to happen with rock uranium. What we often will do is give larger doses of intravenous agents, hyperventilate the patient, or avoid succinylcholine in general uh, when we're worried about intraocular pressure. Ketamine raises intraocular pressure, but our drugs, even though they can raise intraocular pressure, things that raise it a lot more are things like Valsalva or pushing on the eyeball or patient coughing or vomiting. So if you mismanage an airway, like putting a tube down someone who's light, not totally paralyzed, and they cough and buck and Valsalva, large increases in intraocular pressure can occur 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury and uh, much more than the effects of our uh, drugs like succinylcholine or ketamine. Oculocardiac reflex is the next keyword topic. It is a cranial nerve 510 reflex. And if we look at the graphic at the top right first, you can see that eye muscles being tugged on or eye pressure can initiate this oculocardiac reflex. It is afferently carried through the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal, to the brain stem via the ciliary ganglion hits the brainstem, and then efferently is carried out through the cranial nerve 10 to the heart, causing bradycardia. So the complications of oculocardiac reflex are bradydysrhythmias, bradydysrhythmias, slowing of the heart rate, hypotension, and even long periods of no heartbeat, asystole. And when you look up, when someone's tugging on the eyeball and you have a whole uh, many seconds of no beats of the heart, you say, get off the eyeball, and they relax the eyeball, and the uh, pulse comes back, and heart rate comes back. Pathophysiology is usually the traction on the extraocular muscles, especially the medial rectus muscle. But manipulation of the globe, like even putting a retrobulbar block, injecting a local anesthetic in the back of the eye, or pressure on the eyeball, can all uh, initiate the oculocardiac reflex. As we said, the afferent is the fifth cranial nerve, trigeminal to the brainstem, fourth ventricle, efferent limb, 10th cranial nerve vagus to the heart, and things that make it worse are light anesthesia, hypercarbia, and hypoxia. It tends to fatigue easily, meaning that if you pulled on the eyeball and then released it, pulled on the eyeball and released it, pulled on the eyeball and released it, third and fourth time you do it, it's uh, less chance that you're going to have quite the bradycardia that you do with the first time. This uh, ocular cardiac reflex is not necessarily prevented by giving prophylactic anticholinergic agents. And so we tend to treat it when it occurs by telling the surgeon to stop pulling on the eyeball, one, and if it continues, giving an anticholinergic agent intravenously, atropine being the example. We do not give atropine intramuscularly uh, to try to prevent it prophylactically, this reflex, 
but give it intravenously when bradycardia is associated with hypotension. So the treatment, get rid of the stimulus, deepen the anesthesia, anticholinergic medications, and local anesthetic infiltration of ex extraocular muscles can stop it. The last slide is retrobulbar versus peribulbar block, our last key word. And retrobulbar blocks require the needle uh, when you're doing the eye block to penetrate in the top right you can see that needle coming in and then penetrating the extraocular muscle cone and going towards the back of the eyeball so it's very deep that you're putting this needle and so there's some structures back there including the optic nerve which can be injured the globe can actually be perforated and uh, dropped like a beach ball a, um, a perforated beach ball retrobulbar hemorrhage can occur if you hit some blood vessels and classically, if you hit some blood vessels, the eyeball tends to become more and more proptotic, uh, being pushed out uh, over time as a bleeding behind the eyeball occurs. The ocular cardiac reflux can occur as the injection and uh, the needle moves the eyeball muscles. So bradycardia could be associated with this injection. One that is uh, classic is the apnea that can occur and you think how can you get apnea from an injection in the eyeball the local anesthetic can actually spread down the optic nerve back towards the brainstem anesthetize the brainstem and apnea and hypotension can occur so if you do an eyeball block with a very small volume of local anesthetic and the patient just suddenly stops breathing becomes severely hypotensive uh, your job should be to provide positive pressure ventilation and blood pressure support because in a very short period of time, if that's the cause, then uh, it should resolve quickly. The retrobulbar block can be combined with a seventh nerve block uh, to prevent squinting of the eyeball. So if you want the eyeball to be numb and the patient not to squint during surgery, you do the retrobulbar to make the eyeball numb and then a seventh cranial nerve block to prevent the squinting. Now the parabol bar, shown on the bottom right, the needle does not penetrate the extraocular extra muscle cone or these muscle fibers. So you can see the needle coming in, unlike the top picture where the needle actually was uh, rotated down and back towards the cone of the eye and perforating the muscle of the eyeball. Now the needle is staying outside that uh, muscle cone and it's superficial and there's a less chance that you can hit blood vessels or damage the optic nerve. There's a larger volume of local anesthetic that is usually injected and it's going to have a little bit slower onset of the block. But peribulbar block, uh, most uh, people believe it is a safer block and uh, done more commonly now than a retrobulbar block. Last slide, remember that uh, anesthesia is awesome and never stop learning, and I hope that you have a great day.